Hi everybody, welcome to the Emory's Memories channel. I'm your announcer, Gary Beatty. This channel was created to feature interviews by Ralph Emory. There are over 125 interviews by Ralph for you to enjoy on this channel. This channel has also become a collection point for rare and in some cases never before seen shows and interviews. What you're about to see is one of 14 classic interviews hosted by the Lagarde Twins from Sydney, Australia. It's part of a TV series they created, and it's called Down Home, Down Under. Now, these interviews have remained in their private collection, and they've never aired on radio or television until now. And here's their one-on-one -on -one interview with Eddie Rabbit. Welcome back to Lagarde Twins, Down Home, Down Under. Now, here's my brother Tom to tell you about our very special guest. In 1968, with a few dollars in his pocket, he took a greyhound to Nashville, Tennessee, with a million dreams tucked under his arm. And now, 20 years later, with millions of record sales and several music awards to his credit, the dreams continue to unfold. That's right, Tom. With time, wisdom, age, all those factors included, he's still writing, singing, performing with the same enthusiasm, same drive with heart and soul that inspired him in the first place. He's our very special guest, Eddie Rabbit. Welcome to the show, Eddie. Hello, guys. How are you? As Eddie. we say in Australia, good day, Eddie. Good day. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was telling you a little earlier, I saw the movie Crocodile, you know, five times, so I've got some of it down pretty good. You forgot to bring the knife, you said. I forgot to bring it. Yeah, I wanted to come out and have you do a little thing. We said, no, that's not a knife. This is a knife. <laughs> Um, Eddie, you, you have a brand new album coming out uh, called Jersey Boy, uh, and uh, we heard on Second Thought uh, your new single, and so tell us how that uh, came about. How you came the out. single? Yeah, the, and, the, and the whole concept and the of the album. One. Well, uh, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> From a big continent, I guess you get big questions. Uh, on second thought, uh, to talk about that, that's a song that I wrote in the back of my bus one night when we were <laughs> traveling, I think, through Montana, uh, doing an 18-day tour through there. I wrote it in about five minutes. Uh, it's just one of those songs that just got written automatically. I don't even know how it got written. It, uh, uh, my manager was back there and my road manager, and uh, we were all talking about the album I was going to do. Uh, and uh, my uh, manager said, why don't you write one of those uh, traditional country songs like you, like you have in the past? Uh, I've always liked those. And, and the guitar was sitting right there, and I said, oh, you mean like this? And I uh, picked up the guitar, just kind of kidding around, and started, sometimes a man does things without everything. Oh. And uh, the song literally fell out of my mouth, uh, actually just kind of fooling around. So I told my road manager, I said, please get a tape recorder real quick. I've got to put this down. Who came up with the concept for the video, re reverting back to like to the black and white, and going back to the like the uh, um, type of show they used to produce years ago as a background? Well, the producer and director. Uh, in fact, it was done right here in the studio where we're sitting right now. I walked right across where this couch is uh, on the last right. shot of that video. Uh, that was uh, Greg Crutcher and Steve uh, Boyles uh, <coughs> had that idea in the beginning, and then we discussed it and talked about it. I like the idea because uh, the other video, the first video that I ever did uh, was uh, The Wanderer and it was in black and white and uh, I like the idea of the black and white, it's kind of a different look. We wanted something different that didn't look like every other video on TV and, uh, and this seemed like a real neat thing to do. And now uh, a lot of people are talking about it because they think that it's an old video of mine <laughs> that they're showing on TV. But it's brand, brand but it's new. But it's brand new with the, with the and it's, what's funny is the song could have been a song that was a hit 25 years ago, too. Well, well that's what I'm saying. I'm sorry, Tom. What, what, what uh, made you decide, because you, many of your songs were crossover hits. It's one thing to have a hit song, say, in the country charts, and it's another thing to have it crossover into the pop charts. Now, on second thought, you've got the walk-up bass and the steel, which is, uh, uh, you know, has the kind of traditional sound with the present state of the arts. Did, did you decide that uh, because of the success of, say, the traditional sound today, that that would probably uh, be the way to go? Not really. I, I never go with the fads or the trends. I just go with what I feel uh, yeah. in, in my body when I'm writing the song. And the song is, sounds like an old song. I wrote it with that feeling in mind when it 
came out of my mouth uh, in about five minutes in the back of the bus. So naturally, it had to have uh, that type of music in the background. I, I just heard it automatically. And the steel guitar lick, which was played by a great player by the name of Paul Franklin, uh, is something that, uh, that he did, but I worked it out with him. I, I knew kind of what I wanted there, mm -hmm. uh, where the steel jumps in a little ahead of the break. Uh, you know, that's something. But the sound, Eddie, is so close. Did I know. You... Well, we all worked on it. See, I, I, I'm very close in the studio with the guys. I had my guitar, and I'm just walking around to all the players singing the song and telling them just kind of what I like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the way I want it. I want that old walking bass. Dum, 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 yeah. dum, now, you know, the, the drums. Harmony, but the harmony. I do all my own harmony. Well, I th because, you know, brothers automatically have almost, a, you know, a built-in, like the Ebony Brothers, almost a built-in harmony. Right. And your harmony is so close and so beautifully. I've always done my own harmonies, yeah. and uh, thank you for bringing that up. Not, no, many I mean people, not many people realize that I do all that. And, yes. I, and I, I do a lot of the arrangements uh, on my songs, too. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a fabulous sounding record. One moment, Tom. Okay. <laughs> you've, <laughs> you've never been interviewed by twins before, so you get, like... No, I haven't. <laughs> you've, had, you've had so many number one hit records that have crossed over into, into the pop field. Um, and one of your great songs, uh, one of your many great songs, uh, when you learned that Alvis had recorded Kentucky Rain, what did it feel like? Oh, it was a great feeling. Uh, did you ever get to meet him in person? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I met him once uh, in Las Vegas. It was a great feeling having uh, Elvis cut the song because uh, uh, he's the king, you know, and it's always nice to have one by a guy like that. And in fact, I have three. He recorded three of my songs. Uh, another one called Inherit the Wind and one called Patch It Up Baby. When he recorded Kentucky Rain, that was the first one he recorded. Uh, it, was, it was great to me in a lot of ways. Uh, Another way it was great uh, was because at that point I had written a few songs here and there and I had some cut, but I was making no money at writing. I was getting album cuts and B-sides and I was getting checks for $12 and $48, you know what I was saying? <laughs> Wasn't this, paying the rent, right? This isn't going to get it, you know. This, uh, I need to do something else here. And then I was talking to another guy that uh, had written 10 top 10 songs one year. Mm -hmm. And he told me the money that he made on it. And a guy doing construction on a highway may, makes more money. And I said... There's got to be another way here, you know. So uh, when Elvis cut Kentucky Rain, uh, uh, it, it, it legitimized my songwriting to me. Mm -hmm. Before I thought, well, I, I write songs, but I'm not making any money at it, so this, uh, this isn't going to support me. It made me feel like I could support myself and I could uh, do better things. We have to take a break right now, but we'll be right back with our special guest, Eddie Rabbit. Yeah, no, the love of the business is what brought me from New Jersey to here, because yeah. uh, as, in, as in the song Jersey Boy that's in the new album, it says, uh, it says, I remember thinking long ago and telling a bartender named Stuart, I don't think I'll ever be discovered singing country music here in Newark. <laughs> and uh, and it's true, I was uh, singing country music in some of the honky-tonks up around Newark, New Jersey, which is next to New York, and... Uh, I didn't think, you know, anybody was going to discover me singing uh, country music there. So I, I knew I had to uh, come to Nashville. I saved up a thousand dollars and took a Greyhound bus in 1968 to Nashville because I, I, I realized that you have to be where, where your kind of music is happening, is being written and being recorded and published and all that, if you're ever going to really get discovered. Mm. I'm going to ask this question, <clears throat> and uh, uh, to me, with all the number one hit songs that you've had, and the crossover, there's very few artists have had the kind of success that Eddie Rabbit has had. And uh, to me, that you've never won a CMA award, it, it hurts me because of your music of what, and, and the contribution that you've done. And you've what made you represent. To, and what you represent and the, and, the, and the contribution that you've made towards the music industry, I think is, is, uh, is not fair, as far as I'm concerned. Is you there know? a reason for Well, that? there's a lot of people that ask me about that, why... Uh, uh, no awards and all that uh, from the CMA over the years, and I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't. I guess politics? I don't like it either. It could be <laughs> politics. It could be uh, a lot of different things. Uh, I come to the point where I don't worry about it. I love the music that I do, and I love the people that are in our audience, and we have sold out shows most of the time. And, but you had to. Think and about that's where it's at. I think it's it's that. I you know awards sometimes are after the fact, aren't they? Yes. So maybe that's just something I'm saying because I haven't got them. Uh, uh, from from the CMA, but uh, I don't think in the long run that's really important. I'll tell you well, what. Well, as an actor, Richard Burton, look, a great uh, English actor. 
never won an award. Never won uh, the Kirk Academy Douglas, Award. Kirk Douglas, the great actor he was, he, you know, never won an award for Spidey because I thought he should have won an award for that. But you know, well, let's Eddie, go shoot somebody. You know, no, seriously. <laughs> you know, if they were to take, if they were to take a public, you know, a, a people's vote, you know, let the people vote. Yeah. I'll guarantee you, you would have won many. CMA well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. That's awful nice. That I mean probably means more than, uh, than any other award that Absolutely. people feel like that. And we, we mean that, and, and we know that the Australian viewing audience, uh, Eddie, I think in the 90s, there's going to be a tremendous revision take place. Uh, uh, exactly came from the, the, the words of your mouth about, uh, you know, all the pornography. I think there's going to be a cleaning up in the industry. You said, like, we all oh have a, a moral obligation to our audience and and uh, um. i think we do i think we do and i think uh, you know people are always going to be greedy i think we're all a little greedy in one way or another like they said in the movie wall street are you greedy? Either, I, I i think uh, in a way uh, we may all be a little greedy like i was going to say in the movie wall street uh, michael douglas had a great uh, line there where he said we have either a greed for money or for knowledge or for sex or for food there's many different kinds of greed uh, uh, I, I think, though, uh, like I said, I think the people in our business are one small part mm -hmm. of uh, a larger problem, but I think we still are responsible to the people out there, to the children, I think. Grown-ups, I think, can make up their own minds. I think. But when you take 12, 13, and 14, 15-year-old people who haven't got a mind, really, mm -hmm. that can decide they need things something. yet, they don't need to be, uh, have it twisted before it's, uh, you know. Do you have children? I have two children. I have an 8-year-old daughter and a 3-year-old uh, son. So that's why you're concerned. Well, I think that's probably, maybe if I didn't have children, I, I wouldn't look at it uh, quite as much. Uh, I think I'd still feel the same way, because I always have. Even before I had children, I didn't like the idea of going on a stage and having to say things that were strange to me. I can't do that. I, I don't think that's entertainment. I think we can hear that at the bar, you know, but uh, right. not on the stage, not on my stage anyway. So you, you, I you think say music and, and things like that are... Uh, I think you uh, you spit on your music when you do that. I think the music is a great thing. It's it's been great to me. I think music is a great thing for people. Uh, I think to go out there and ruin it with a lot of crap, you know, like that. Uh, oops. Uh, that's, uh, that's right. It's that's just okay. a, sin, a shame. It's a sin that we have to. Uh, you know, I don't know what Beethoven would think of uh, some of the stuff that's on the radio today, but I don't. I, I think there's a lot of different kinds of music. You know, one <laughs> thing about your music too, Eddie. I think that that is <coughs> that it has an international appeal that uh, you've never localized your music. Um, well, I hope so, because I'd like to go to Australia and well, play you for, will. Uh, you like will. To, uh, play for some Come folks. down here? Absolutely. Beautiful. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, from what I've seen of it, it's a very interesting place and a uh, place I'd like to go to. I've often thought about this, like a writer of your capability and creativity going to Australia, for instance, spending maybe two or three months down there and walking in the shoes, say, of an Australian, seeing things through their eyes and then writing songs uh, what kind of songs would you come up with you know it would be very very interesting and then say taking sure. an Australian writer and, and bringing the Australian writer uh, yeah. uh, over to here and see how he'd uh, yeah yeah reflect what he sees in the songs yeah because you know That'd in America you in could America. call it down home down under in America, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the name of the show? Yeah. yeah. Down home. Oh, down. <laughs> Somebody was telling me, I said, was it over and out and down under or something? <laughs> well, uh, any which way but loose. That was a, that's a title for a Every song. Every which way but loose. Every which way but yeah. loose. And the, sec the sequel was, uh, any which, was it any which way you can, I think. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, did you write that specifically for the I movie? didn't write that song. Oh, that you didn't write that? That song was written by... Uh, let me but you sang it. The guy, yeah. Uh, that was written by uh, Milton Brown and Steve Dorff and uh, Snuff Carrot. Yeah. Uh, that song came to me... Uh, did you get to uh, work or get to meet uh, Clint Eastwood? Yeah, or? we did. At the premiere of the movie in Dallas, Texas, uh, Clint and I got to meet and to talk a little bit. In fact, we sang a little bit together. Uh, Is that right? Yeah. He's not bad. He, he likes country music, apparently. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Sure. Is he a nice guy? Uh, um, Seems yeah. like a nice guy. The mm -hmm. time we spent together, he was uh, cordial and friendly and nice to everybody. Eddie, well, where does Eddie Rabbit oh, go from here? Sorry, you got a new album coming out. There's uh, new album, yeah. Jersey yeah. Boy. Jersey Boy. Uh, um, your singles going great. Your videos this. going great. Uh, where do you where do, where'd you like to see Eddie Rabbit say, ten years from now, looking to the future? Oh, I don't know. Maybe sitting on my back porch, looking out at all the trees. <laughs> Come on, you're too young. <laughs> <laughs> you're just a baby. <laughs> You know? Yeah, just a baby. 
good guys here. Good so guys. You, here. If you say, what do they say? Uh, you know, uh, you become as small as your controlling desire, or yeah. as great as your dominant aspirations. You know. Well, you know, I, I've got, uh, like I said, uh, I've got a real nice wife, or a pretty wife, Janine, and I've got two kids, and I don't see them as much as I'd like to. And I'll be honest with you, I'd like to have the, the freedom. Uh, uh, with the success of these things as they come to be able to get our dates a little tighter so that we can work you know more in a smaller period of time um, so that you could be home more well because I really do like playing with my kids and uh, bring and them my down wife. to Australia <laughs> have a nice vacation we've been talking with our special guest Eddie Rabbit what a fabulous conversation and an interview with Eddie we hope that you've enjoyed it what a great classic one-on-one -on -one interview with Ted and Tom, the Lagarde Twins. I want to tell you about their book, The Lagarde Twins, Showbiz Hustlers. Let me take you back to the beginning. These twin boys walk 15 miles across the bushlands of Australia to a tent with a dirt floor and folding chairs. As the projector started up, the movie appeared in black and white on the screen, and there for the first time, they saw Hopalong Cassidy. They ran almost all the way home and told their mom, we're going to become cowboy singers. Let me read the introduction to Showbiz Hustlers. Being raised in the bushlands of Australia in the 1930s and 40s was a rough and hard life. We didn't think about it back then because that's how life was. You have to live the hard life to understand it. But we also made a picture in our minds of the kind of life we wanted to lead, and it became a beacon that has guided us on our long journey in show business. We hope and pray that our book falls into the hands of our fellow strugglers and dreamers to give them unfailing encouragement to pursue their hopes and dreams. Above all else, we want to give God all the praise and glory for our long lives and for His mercy and grace in dealing with us throughout the years. So grab the reins and ride over one million miles with us from the bushlands of Australia across seven continents through 23 countries and 45 of the 50 states in America. Let's ride. Ted and Tom Lagarde. They appeared in Vegas, movies and TV shows. And for you Trekkies out there, get this. This book is packed with pictures and stories and is a must read. We'll put a link below the video so you can get your copy of The Lagarde Twins Showbiz Hustlers. The Lagarde Twins Showbiz Hustlers makes a great gift. This book is about twin brothers from Australia who had a dream and it came true. This is Gary Beatty and as Ted and Tom Lagarde would say, Good day, mate.